Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we'll be doing a complete walkthrough tutorial of making this level in Godot. We'll be covering a bunch of topics including grid maps, star shaders, sky shaders, and space backgrounds. And hopefully everyone can take something away with them that will apply to any kind of level you make. We're starting out with a new project, so let's create a new scene and save it. For a space level, one of the most important things is the background, since that's at least like 80% of our screen at any given moment. And for that, you're going to need a space panorama, an acre rectangular panorama to be specific, one that's kind of stretched at the top and the bottom. You can find one online or you can download one of mine I created for this project. If you'd like a bit more control, you can use Spacescape to create your own, so go check out my tutorial on that. Once you have one, you're going to need to add it to your level by creating a new world environment node, adding a new environment to it, double clicking on the environment to open its settings, and then changing our background mode to sky. This is going to add a sky section to our settings and in the sky attribute create a new sky and add a new panorama sky material to it. That's a lot of hoops that we just jumped through but once we click on the sky material we can add our background image to the panorama attribute to use it as our level background. We'll be animating this one a bit later but for now it's looking a little too muted so let's jump into the adjustments section and crank up the saturation a little bit. After after that's done, let's start populating the map. First, we'll add a star. Weirdly, I couldn't find any good star models online, which I guess makes sense because half of the fun is animation, which just means we'll have to make our own star. To make our own star, we're going to need a surface texture. I'm just going to take a sun surface texture off this website and mess around with the colors a little bit. If we open it in Krita and go into Filter, Adjust, Color Balance, we can change the colors from the boring old sun into something that fits the rest of the background. Here I also turned off the preserve luminosity setting and kept adjusting the colors until I had something fun looking. Now after exporting this texture back into Godot, we're going to create a new 3D scene for the star. Change the root node type to a mesh instance 3D and then after clicking on it, choose sphere mesh as its mesh type. By default it's small, so we want to make it way bigger. Click on the mesh resource and change its radius to something like a thousand and its height to double that. Then save the scene real quick and let's add a new material to it. In our material settings we're going to go down to the albedo section and drag our star surface texture we imported into here. After that turn on emission for the material and again drag our star surface texture into the emission texture setting. Then we can raise the energy multiplier on the emission to make the star a little brighter. Now that we have the base done let's animate it a little bit using a shader. Hit this drop down next to the material material and quick convert to shader material. Now when we click on the material we have access to everything it does but inside of shader code. What we want is the vertex function here because we want to move around the sphere vertices to imitate solar flares and stuff. So we're going to move each point on our mesh starting with their y coordinate. We're going to increment it by the result of the sine function of our time parameter which is how much time has passed since our game started running. Now the star is too big for it to be noticeable but you can see the result in the material here. It's basically bouncing with the sign of our time. But if we multiply the result of this by 10 it becomes noticeable even with the big star. But what we really want is for each vertex to move individually so we'll also add our x and z coordinates to our time. And now if we zoom into the top of our star we can see these sort of waves forming. To see the full result we're also going to have to do the same thing to the x and z coordinates. So let's copy this over and change each line so the position of each coordinate is affected by the sign of the other two coordinates. That's better, but now our star is a little spazzy. So we'll also multiply these coordinates by 0.5 to make the effect a bit less pronounced. Or, you know what, maybe we'll multiply it by 0.2. So now that the surface animation is done, we also want it to rotate around its axis. And we're not going to mess around with shaders or anything like that, we're just going to add an animation player. Let's create a new animation and call it Rotate. We'll change the animation length to a thousand seconds and then add a new property track for the rotation of the star. We basically want it to rotate 360 degrees around its y-axis in this time, so the way to do this is to have a looping animation 
animation that goes from 0 degrees rotation to 360 degrees rotation. And we'll do this by inserting keyframes in the beginning and the end of the animation. At the end of the animation, our keyframe for Y rotation will be 360 degrees, and we'll turn on auto start and whoop. Now let's add the start to the scene and position it kind of far from the origin. Problem here though is that we're placing it past the camera render distance, so let's increase that. If we go into this view drop down and click settings, there's a setting for view Z4, which we want to raise to 80,000 units. So now after placing the star where we want it, let's add a camera to the scene. We want to make sure to change its far distance just like we did for the editor camera. Now let's rotate the camera to look at the star. Click preview to see where it's looking right now and then adjust it from there. So there are a couple of things that we can do with the world environment to make the game look better as well as to make our star pop out more. To lower the fuzziness of the background we're going to lower the sky energy multiplier to 0.8 and we're going to go back to the adjustments tab and raise the contrast just a little bit and then raise the brightness to make the areas that didn't get taken out by the contrast pop out. And finally we're going to go into the glow settings and enable it. Then we're going to set our bloom to 0.2 and change the blend mode to screen which makes our star all glowy. I think it looks pretty good. Here's a before and here's an after. So now let's add some decorations. Links to everything will be in the description and first we got this low poly space station that looks really cool with all the lights and of course no space game can go without asteroids. So let's add these two to the project. I have them in GOB format and let's double click on the station here and click re-import. After that right click and choose new inherited scene. Let's save the scene real quick and then to have access to all of the nodes here we need to right click on the root node and click clear inheritance. We're going to clean up all of the random nodes here and now we're going to get the station to do a spinny thing just like the star. You know the drill here, add an animation player, create a new animation called rotate. We're gonna set the length here to 100 seconds, create those keyframes, and then set the rotation on the second one to 360 degrees. Don't forget auto start and whoop, and let's add the space station to the scene. Right now, there's no light here, so we're going to need to add a directional light to the scene and to kind of make it seem like it's coming from the star. Now, I have a method for that. Assuming that our star casts shadows, we can change the angle of the directional light until the star casts a shadow on the station and then turning off the shadows for the star, which effectively makes it seem like our direction light is coming from the star or at least for objects in the general vicinity of the station. So we'll add a directional light to the scene and if we go into the transform section here we can change the direction from where the light is coming from by changing the rotation degrees of the directional light. Now for the star to be able to cast a shadow on the station we have to increase the shadow max distance at least for now. Finally let's turn on shadows and figure out the rotation that we want. We'll start with the Y rotation and make sure that the glare on the station is aligned with the star and we can expand this toolbar here so we can get a bit more precision and don't have to enter the values manually. And for the X rotation we're just looking for when the light cuts out sharply. Now if you're wondering I do feel a little ridiculous doing this so if any of you have a better way I'd love to hear it. Obviously using a directional light here instead of an omni light gives us a constraint in the form of it not working properly if we were to move this scene to the other side of the star. But a directional light is way more performance performance, so it's a trade-off. Now that we got the light positioning right, let's go into our star geometry section and turn off the cast shadow setting. Now finally, to get the shadows working properly with the scene, we're going back to the directional light and lowering the shadow distance to a thousand. We're going to go for orthogonal shadows for the extra performance, and one thing you'll notice is that the shadows are a little offset from the objects, and there are a couple of things that we can do to help with that, but we'll go for raising the angular distance to two degrees. This is the setting for how large our fake light source is when viewed from our position. For example, the sun is 0.5 degrees from the earth, but we're a bit closer to the star, so 2 degrees seems appropriate. The main benefit of angular distance, however, is that the shadows are blurred more the farther they get from the object that cast them, which is what is supposed to happen with non-point light sources. To close the final bit of distance between the shadow and the object, we're going to lower the shadow blur to 0. 
0.4. Finally, let's lower the shadow opacity to like 0.9 to make them a bit less rough and change the light color to match our star. Here, we don't have to get too overzealous because even the slightest changes in light color are pretty noticeable. So we got the lighting and shadows done. Now, let's get started on the asteroids. We have them in GOB format, just like the space station, and we're going to create a new inherited scene from them. Save this scene and right click on the root node and select clear inheritance, like last time. We're going to clean up this hierarchy so only the mesh nodes are in it, and then name each of the mesh nodes descriptively to soothe my OCD. After that, just so that we don't have to worry about this later, let's add collisions to these. To each of the meshes, we'll add a static body node, and to that static body node we'll add the collision shape. For most of them we'll add a sphere collision shape and conveniently the meshes are about the size of the default sphere shape. After all of the static bodies are done we're going to save the scene again Go into the scene menu and select export as mesh library. Name it asteroids and then click save. This should give us an asteroids.trs file in our folder, which we can use with a grid map to make placing the asteroids around way easier. So we'll add a grid map node to the world scene and let's do some setup here. We'll go into the cell settings and change the cell size, which affects the snapping distance of the objects we're placing around. This is pretty much personal preference unless you're trying to tile meshes with this. After that, let's drag the exported mesh library into the corresponding field in the grid map. These asteroids are going to be a bit small for the map, so let's also scale them up. We're going to have two grid maps here eventually just to add some variety in the scale of the asteroids, but once we're happy with the scale of this one, we'll drag it to be the child of the space station because we want the asteroids to orbit it. Just gonna make sure that the transform is at the station's origin real quick, and then we're gonna start placing them. We just left click to place them and we can erase them with right click. It's a little hard to see but I'm also rotating them on different axes using A, S and D keys to add a bit of variety. And finally to move on the Z axis of the grid I'm using control scroll. This is not well advertised but you don't actually have to click away from the grid map to move around. You can press shift F to enter free look mode. Thank you kind stranger on the internet this saved me a lot of time. After this grid map is done we're going to add yet an another animation player and create a new animation. Call it, I don't know, spin? No. It's rotate. You know the drill here. It's pretty much all the same except for the target rotation degrees. It's going to be negative 360 because we want the asteroids to spin the other way. But when you start the scene, you might start wondering why the asteroids look like they have about three polygons across all of them. Well, it's because they do. At these distances, the Godot's automatic LOD is kicking in. And in case some people don't know, LOD stands for level of detail, which is a mechanism by which games switch out meshes to less detailed ones when an object is far away to save resources. So we're going to turn it off for now by going into the project settings in this mesh LOD section and turning down the threshold pixels setting to zero. I'm gonna skip over creating a second grid map with twice the scale with asteroids spinning little slower because the process is just the same but it adds a little bit of variety. So now that we got a basic scene done let's work on animating the background and turning it from this to this. The idea comes down to overlaying another panorama on top of our original one and moving it using a sky shader. The panorama that we have here is basically a couple of layers of colored ridged noise that can be overlaid over a sphere with no distortions. We can generate 2D noise in Godot but that would distort if we were to just put it on a sphere. Or we can generate 3D noise but that is super expensive and would affect load time significantly. So my solution to this is to just use the same free program that I used to make the background to generate this noise for us. It's called Spacescape and I highly recommend it if you're going to dabble with this stuff. This is the scene for the noise and these four are the noise layers that make this whole thing up. And let's quickly go over some of the settings so you can recreate it if you need to. The bottom layer is the baseline nebula and everything else is just highlights. All of these layers are basically the same generated noise with the same seed etc. But the way that the highlights are created is by having a higher 
higher threshold than the baseline. So if we want stronger highlights, we set a lower threshold for them. And if we want them more subtle, we set a higher threshold. Now these top two layers not only have a higher threshold, but their noise scale is also slightly offset, which makes it almost the same noise, but not quite. It might be a little subjective, but to me, it makes this seem a little less artificial. Cool. So we got some noise in a program. Now what? How do we get it into Godot? Well, Spacecape exports cube maps, and there's a simple online converter that we can use to turn that into a panorama. And I go over the whole process in that other video I mentioned earlier. Going through this process will give us an image similar to our background that we can now overlay on top of it. So let's go back to the world environment, and if we hit the sky material drop down, there's an option for converting it into a sky shader material, which is what we want. Now, the material has a shader parameter for the source panorama which should be our background, and I'm not sure why that didn't carry over, so we're just going to drop it here. Let's open the shader by clicking here and add another parameter for the noise texture. We're just going to copy over the code that defines the source panorama parameter and rename it to noise panorama, which gives us another parameter over here. We're going to drag our noise from the file system there. So let's take a look at the shader code here. In case you're a little familiar with shaders, the sky function here is basically like a fragment function in a normal shader, meaning that the point is to set the color of each fragment slash pixel that we're drawing. And to do that, we have the sky coordinate that we're passing to the panorama to get the color of that fragment. So what we can do then is just add the color of the noise panorama on top of the color of the source panorama. Then we can multiply it by 0.2 to make it a little more subtle or even 0.1. Finally, we need a way to make it rotate. And to do that, we're going to modify the sky coordinates that we're passing with the noise panorama. We'll create a new vector 2 and set it to the current sky coordinate. After that, we'll add the time parameter times a super small value to the x component of the sky coordinate. And don't forget the x part of this, because if you do, it's gonna look weird when you change the coordinate we're passing. So let's fix that real quick and feast our eyes on the results of our waiver. Make sure to like the video if you learned something. Thank you for watching. All of the project files are available to my patrons at the link in the description. And check out this video if you are going to use Spacecape for your projects. I'll see you next time.